You're watching Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Don Kanabi, he is a member of the Board of Supervisors in Los Angeles County. He is also the host of Dialed In with Don Kanabi. You can watch that program on the California Channel and Charter Channel 101. So it's good to have you back on my program, I guess. Yeah, I want right. to be on your program we'll one day. We'll get you there. Nice you to have you with me. invite me. Thank you again. I want to talk to you about a phenomenon that is a new one in Los Angeles County, San Bernardino County. It's kind of permeating throughout the area. And it's the notion of what we call birthing tourism. Now, this is different than the notion of anchor babies. Could you explain that distinction? Well, I mean, a big dis I think the most significant distinction, obviously, regardless of the term anchor babies, sure. they, they come here for a very specific purpose and they stay here forever. That's, okay? yes. So they Bur the mother will have a baby right. and stay with right. the baby. Right. Birthing tourism is different. Birthing tourism, they, they usually come the eighth or ninth month, you know, the last month of pregnancy. They probably lie about it because no doctor would let them on an airplane. Right. They come over here, have the baby, sometimes in a clinic, sometimes in these houses, uh, and then they go back. Cool. And then it gives them a birth certificate and the right of birth, but gives them the opportunity to access the system later on or right. come back for educational purposes. And that's the key. You know, with, quote, anchor babies, it tends to be women of less economic means that are coming over for a better life for the entire family. With the birthing tourism, they're not looking to stay. They're just looking for that citizenship. So Absolutely. when the child grows up, presumably for college, I mean, that's what we're hearing, they can get into American universities. Exactly. With um, anchor babies that tend to be Latin American, the birthing tourism is coming from Asia. Primarily. Primarily. Uh, Asia, uh, you know, it's a significant, in my district, in the Hacienda Heights, Rolling Heights right. area, there's also an issue in Koreatown. Uh, there's also an issue out in the valley with uh, Russian immigrants as right. well, too. But it, it clearly is an issue of accessing the system. Uh, and, and again, you know, the immigration issue has to be dealt with of on, course. A, on a national basis. But the point here being is the health of the baby and the mother and where, it, where it's going. I mean, we've had complaints of, you know, bloody sheets and afterbirth and all those kinds of things in neighborhoods. And, and let's talk about that because we hinted at it. So right. sometimes these babies are being born in clinics and then the women and baby were moved to convalesce in a home. A right, residential home. Exactly. We basically just take a four-bedroom home and you make it into 12 bedrooms. I mean, they're called the maternity hotels. Exactly. Which used to be a term that was used for, I guess, at-risk mothers, teen mothers. Mm -hmm. But now it's these immigrants or not, no, I mean, tourists, birthing tourists. Right. And so talk to me about what you've been hearing from these in your case, San Gabriel Valley communities? Well, I think because of the media coverage of this issue, it's come more to the forefront. The original big issue, public issue, was in Chino Hills. Right. Uh, so it sort of moved. So with the media covering now, we have found that a lot of the neighbors that have been intimidated in the past uh, are coming forward with complaints in their neighborhoods. And so we're investigating all that we can. Uh, I brought in a motion to create a task force of all the people involved from mental health, health services, regional planning, sheriff, DA, whatever it may be, to see what we can or can't do under existing law and what might need to be changed. And I was very surprised to learn that under current law, if an inspector, let's say, wants to go and investigate whether a home has been converted into a maternity hotel, they can't just walk in. Exactly. They need, it, it's a voluntary entry. Right, and part of my motion was to have also access extra dollars to allow for translators because there's a real language barrier there. But we find them walking in our parks, uh, we, you know, our neighborhoods. Uh, but you know, let's be honest, sir. I mean, if the admission has to be consensual, I mean, you're never going to get an inspector to be allowed in. Well, that's, that's what we're looking at in this right. task force to see how we can gain access uh, or how, you know, what, what under existing law can we do? I mean, strictly a code enforcement. I mean, there's enough things I think we can do under code enforcement to gain access at some particular point. Now, but we also need to be able to speak the language. Now, is it in violation to have four bedrooms in your home and each room is dedicated to a respective mother and their child? Is that by definition? By definition, obviously it was done probably without any, you know, building codes or those right. kinds of things. Uh, the other thing that comes into place are all your HIPAA considerations for health care. Okay. Uh, that you would have to have as it relates to the ability to give birth, the ability to follow up. Right. It's not a clinic situation. Can one have a baby in a home? Yeah, you can do a midwife kind of a thing. I okay. mean, that's that, but the average person that's here legitimately for that, if you have a, you know, first thing you do is an ambulance on scene right. 
to transport they the mom and baby. would be very nervous right. to contact right. the authorities. And so, so the other piece of this is we don't know for sure. I mean, they want that birth certificate, but is this a scam? Is it an online scam? It's all cash. There's no trace. We don't know if doctors are taking cash. Right. Some babies are born in clinics. Some aren't. Um, we don't know. I mean, these mothers would have no way of knowing if they got a legitimate birth certificate from Los Angeles right. County or United States. Here's another issue, and you mentioned the issue of the federal immigration question, but is there a way to bring ICE in? If they're seeing women walk off planes from Asian destinations, Russian destinations, that are clearly nine months pregnant, I mean, is that something that, can they be interceded at the border? Well, I don't think you can do it at the border. I think the issue being, uh, at this particular point, um, the issue being once they hit the neighborhoods. I mean, it's not going to be You can't do anything at the border. Not at this particular point. We don't think. But that's, again, that's why we've convened uh, this task force to do that. You know, there's, there's a lot of people, some of the immigration groups that come forward and say this is anti-immigrant. And this is not anti, I'm not anti-immigrant. People right. know me. But what it is, it's a real safety issue for the baby and the mother. Uh, and, you know, and the illegal transfer of cash. Right. It's that simple. I mean, so we don't know if the franchise tax board should be. I mean, are there, tax, are there IRS? income tax consequences? Yeah. I mean, if someone's taking money for it, they should be filing on their tax returns. Absolutely. It's all cash. There's no checks. There's no credit cards. So where do we go from here? I understand, you know, we're dealing at least, as I know, with two counties, L.A. and San Bernardino. I don't know if it's happening anywhere else. Have, I mean, are there. Well, we hear it's happening all over the United States. And, uh, I think Vancouver's having an issue right. on the Canadian side. Right. And so it, it's, it's an area where there's a lot of immigrant access kind of a situation. Where we go next is to find out, trying to get our arms around. We're still moving forward on code enforcement violations, trying to gain access, trying to get interpreters on the scene, because we do have a right, uh, you know, if certain things persist as it relates to a building code violation. But ultimately, you need a court order. To Absolutely. gain entry without right. if we consent. Need, I mean, that's part of the purpose of this group, too, is to see what do we need to do for that warrant to walk through that door with, if we don't get cooperation. I mean, the, the Chino Hills case is a perfect example. I mean, basically, the guy didn't show up in court, sort of thumbed his nose at the system. Uh, so, and, and in that case, when the code enforcer walked into the home, describe what he found. I'm not sure exactly what he oh, found, we, except that he found an illegal, I mean, it was, as far as they were concerned, right. an illegal operation, um, you know, a four-bedroom home that had been converted. You know, they're doing- Put up put, walls. Right, put up walls, illegal walls, temporary walls. You know, they're also using apartment buildings. Wow. And so one of the things may be that this operation may be legal. I mean, you, you, have, right. you have zoning issues, okay? It's clearly illegal to do birthing in a, a, a residential zone. In, now, that, in, that in a commercial capacity. zone, it may be possible under existing conditions. But again, all the HIPAA issues, all the healthcare issues come into effect. You can't just set up a birthing farm right. for without the proper medical care. So are they seeing doctors? Are the doctors getting paid cash and not report? I mean, what? that's what we're trying to get our arms around. So what about the state? Do we need Sacramento to get involved? I mean, maybe Washington, but maybe not. I don't. Well, Assemblyman Kurt Hagman. Uh, Hagman right. He, he represents that right, Chino Hills right. area. Right, and he's he's doing some legislation. We haven't seen a copy of it yet, but he's in the process of working on it. We may we may need that. And again, we may need federal help too, as it relates to any federal legislation, as a, as it relates to the immigration. Now, Chino Hills, I believe it's incorporated, correct? Yes. So, do we need that that city as an example to pass their own zoning or can the county do well, it? Well, the city can do their own zoning issues. The county becomes the health care advocate. And so depending, I'm not sure the structure of San Bernardino County, but like we... Or we, even on the L.A. County right. side, Roland Hills, Hacienda Heights. Right. Uh, on our side, right. we, we are the, the health care provider there. Right. The only two systems I believe have their own public health department are the city of Pasadena and Long Beach. Right. But that's a public health, not the health. Sure. So... From, from their standpoint, Chino Hills can do what they need to do on the zoning level. On the health piece, that would probably right. be up That's to why the county's right. implicated so right. dramatically. Okay, his name is Don Kanabi. He is a member of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. If you have not seen his show, you should. It's very good. It's called Dialed In with Don Kanabi. My name is Brad Palmer. It's you are watching Charter California Edition.
This is Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Gary DeLong, member of the Long Beach City Council. Welcome back, sir. I want to speak with you about gun violence. There's a lot of discussion nationally about what can be done to try to limit gun, gun violence. A lot of discussion on the other side about the Second Amendment. But what's interesting is cities can do things. There are things, actions that cities can take. And Long Beach is looking to take one such action. Why don't you tell us about a recent vote dealing with a buyback? Well, a couple of things. First of all, that uh, I did support that measure. I think we should look into it. And what's the measure? Tell the, the, us. the measure is to have a gun buyback program. People bring their guns in, you, you, you purchase them. Okay. Um, and while I think it has some measure of effectiveness, certainly guns that are hanging around the house, they've been there for a long time, you don't throw them away, what can I do with it? Hey, bring it to the city, we'll buy it back. But, but honestly, we don't feel it'll have any significant impact on crime, and, and there's a certain amount of feel-goodness to it. But there's, no, but there's certainly no downside, so we're going to take a close look at it. What else can cities do? when looking at gun violence. It gets a little complicated because there's the city, there's the county, there's the state, there's the feds. Um, but I've learned recently that cities actually can take some serious steps if they so choose uh, as it relates to guns and gun rights. We can, but, but oftentimes you need a state solution. I'll give you an example. Uh, the council looked a couple years ago at uh, uh, putting policies in place regarding the, the sale and the acquisition of gun ammunition. Right. Great, great potential. And then you looked at it and said, okay, well, basically that'll just send all those people two miles across the border to go buy their ammunition in the next city. One could argue, so, yes, no doubt. So that really wouldn't have had any benefit. However, had the state come up with a statewide policy, then it certainly would have been something we would have supported. But as you walk around your district, for example, a fairly well-off area yes. in Los Angeles, are people talking to you about this issue? Is it on the top of their minds? When you look at the national media, you know, gun violence, gun control, Second Amendment, it's, you know, top of news. I hear a lot of people talking about it, but what about in your area? Well, it's, it's top of news when something happens. But right. here in the city of Long Beach, we're at a 40-year violent crime low. And it is so interesting that you mentioned that because there is no doubt that during this recession, for whatever reason, we went against... Uh, past trends and we yes. saw a decrease in crime right. during tough economic times. At the same time though, Long Beach is not unique in what I'm about to say, which is we're starting to see an uptick in property crimes. Oh, more than an uptick. It's, in it's Long pretty, Beach, for example. It's significant. And you would have thought it would have been worse when the recession was worse, but as we're coming out of this, we're seeing this uptick. But part of that, as you probably know, is due to the state realignment where there's a lot of prisoners that are early released that they're putting back on but the streets. Do we know, though, that it is these AB 109 prisoners, as they're called, that are committing these fairly low-level property crimes? We have no doubt it's a significant percentage. It's not 100%, but a significant percentage is due to AB 109 and realignment, absolutely. So let's talk about what is being done in Long Beach as an example to try to bring those numbers sure. back into a controllable you area. Well, I'll give an example. that When you look at property crime, the, a significant majority of those crimes are due to an unlocked car door unlocked house door, unlocked window. So we, we tell residents, we can't afford to put a police officer on every corner, but the number one thing you can do is lock your doors when you leave the house, lock the doors when you're at the house. You want crime to diminish property crime? That's the first thing you could do. At the same time, Long Beach has its own police department. We do. Uh, you don't operate through the county. And so Long Beach continues to face structural deficits. Year in and year out, there's a deficit. Where are the budget priorities in terms of public safety? Well, you know, that's the battle that we have every year. I know that. Right? Every year is do you, do you fully fund your police and fire department because public safety is number one. But if you do that, then pretty soon you're going to be a very safe city that nobody wants to live right. in. So it, it's all about balance and listening to your Now, are you in the middle of the budget discussions right now? No, we're not. We're in our, our FY13 budget. It began October 1st. We'll start our FY14 budget planning process in May. And how's it looking? I mean, i got to think there are projections. <clears throat> I mean, does, does Prop 30's passage at all help cities? Is there a Negligible. Okay. Negligible amount. What really helps us is to be more creative. For example, our fire chief, uh, Mike DeRee, is doing out outstanding job of kind of reinventing the fire department. How do you provide fire services? How do you provide medical services? And he has streamlined the organization. I'll tell you, of all the department heads, he's doing a terrific That's job of how to provide the same or better level of service for less money. Chief McDonald on the police department, he's doing right. the same thing. What about the port? Because we are hearing a continual um, 
a lot of good news coming out of the port. I mean, a lot of great been, news. Yeah, there's been a, a, a kind of a lingering labor dispute, but there's good Unfortunately, news. Unfortunately, it's yes. lingering. We thought, we thought that was behind know, us, but apparently I, we it's did. not. But still, Middle Harbor. Yes, I mean, it's a billion dollar project. Now, does that help? This, is the port in the city of Long Beach? The port is, uh, well, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a state of California, okay. and the city of Long Beach manages the port of Long Beach and a trust arrangement with the state. Okay. But we do benefit from the port. Do right? you get sales tax? No, we don't get sales tax. Do you get some tax? We, or? <laughs> we, we, we get a certain percentage, I'll say, of like profits. Okay. Where the council can request up to 10%, which can range anywhere from, from $9 million to $20 million a year. And so... And we do benefit from There that. is no doubt, though, that the fact that the Port of Long Beach, as well as Sister Port, Port of Los Angeles, that they're doing well is of benefit to the bottom line of the city budget. Yes, and not just because of that cash, but really, more importantly, because of the of the high wage jobs right. it brings to our community, right. that's probably a much bigger in cap impact. I want to talk about some very good <clears throat> news coming out of Long Beach. Uh, we are on the coast here in Long Beach. Yes. We are a surfing community, a swimming community, and I know that you are particularly proud of a project that was just given the green light. Why don't you tell us about it and talk about the import? I it. will. It's, we're going to invest $60 million into a new Belmont Pool aquatic facility. There will be two of these facilities that are west of the Mississippi. There's one up in Federal Way in Washington, and now there will be one in Long Beach, California. We're going to go back to our history back in the 60s where we built the, Belmont, the original Belmont Pool facility for the 1968 Men's Olympics. We've had NCAA championships there in the 70s, but the pool got outdated. We're going to bring that back, and it's going to be a great economic investment and an even more important investment in our youth. I've got... I received story after story of, of kids that got that scholarship to Stanford or right. been on the East Coast Ivy League schools or URC or what have you because of diving or because of water polo. It's, it's a wonderful but asset. Now, when you say it will be one of two west of the Mississippi, what do you mean? Well, for example, to have an indoor 10-meter diving platform. Oh. Only two. There'll That's two. it? Two. two. It, it, exactly. West of the, I mean, how is that possible? It is. They're mostly outdoors. And if you look at all the facilities, they're outdoor, they're not indoor. In Olympics, it's an indoor so, sport. So, so Greg Luganus was at the council meeting. Uh, oh, really? Olympian Greg Luganus, another other a number of Olympians came down to explain to the city council how important it was to do it right the first time. Okay, so give us a sense of how is this happening. I mean, we've just talked about structural deficits. How are sure. you able to do this right well, now? Well, Tidelands revenue, so which the port plays a role, goes in their Tidelands account. It's called, say it again? It's called Tidelands. Ti okay. So I, we can't spend this money on police or fire or public works projects outside, can't fix street sidewalks, but you can invest it in your beaches. Now, we still got to get through the state, state Lands Commission with this project. We still oh, got to no. get through the Coastal Commission. So there's hurdles to get, oh, yeah. no. there's hurdles to get through, Although, but we're going to do it. Is we're it one of your it. colleagues? His name is Robert Garcia, a new member of the California is, Coastal Commission? He is a new member. Will he have to recuse himself for this vote? No, absolutely not. But, uh, I mean, I think about the Coastal Commission, and, you know, God love them, but, you know, they can be a little persnickety. Uh, no? More, well, uh, uh, I, Bureaucratic is the problem, is that they get a bee in their bonnet and they get, for example, I need to weigh a number of stakeholders when I make a decision. I don't get to just do what you want. The Coastal Commission oftentimes says, well, we're only going to pay attention to this one principle, even though there's, there's 52 that are coming at them. I think it's crazy the way they do it. But I do want to zero in on this issue because yes. we know that the Coastal Commission can really turn things upside down. They have. In fact, I'm trying to rebuild seawalls in Naples. We have homes that are in imminent danger of collapse. We get a next major earthquake, these homes are sliding in the canal. We've appropriated funds at the city council a week and a half or a year and a half ago, almost $10 million. I can't get the Coastal Commission to approve it because we want a cost-effective $9 million uh, water site option. They say, well, we want you to do it on the land side. Doesn't matter you have to remove almost 100 trees. Doesn't matter you're going to dig up people's front yards and, and potentially impact their foundation. It doesn't matter that this project could double in cost. It doesn't matter. We just prefer you to be on so the land side. So what do you do? Uh, we'll fight them in court if we, if we need to. But on this issue of the aquatic center, I mean, yes. is it, it's in the coastal zone? Is it it's right? in the coastal zone, but one of the things we're trying hard to do is we're going to stay within the existing footprint and not expand it. Okay. So that so way that when we rate, we take down the existing facility, we put a new one out, we're going to say, look, we're not expanding, we're not taking more beach, we're going to stay within the existing footprint the best we can. Presuming that we get the approvals we need, when do we expect to break ground? When will it be completed? Well, you know, you framed that question very well, <laughs> assuming the pro approvals. We can build this facility within 18 months, okay. design and build it. It could take us a year, two years to get to permits for Coastal. His name is Gary DeLong, member of the Long Beach City Council. I'm Brad Palmer. We thank you for watching Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are now joined by James Johnson. He is a member of the Long Beach City Council. And sir, we drive around Long Beach. Some of the areas are quite built up and quite beautiful. Some mm -hmm. areas need a little work. Um, you know, it's an older city. And so you've been looking at infrastructure improvements and maybe we have money now for those? Yeah. Well, you know, Brad, we have something called, uh, you know, our oil money. So we have right. these one-time monies that are supposed to be used for one-time uses. And one of the things I've been stressing is if we have monies available, let's put it back in our infrastructure, things right. like streets and sidewalks. Because our, my parents, my grandparents, they, they invested a lot of money to make this street and sidewalk network work for us. And we need to do the same thing, not just for now, but for our kids. So what exactly is the money being used for in the city of Long Beach as an example of infrastructure improvements in California? Well, one example would be we're actually doing street maintenance. You know, it's kind of like the example of the car owner who says, I'm going right. to save money, I'm not going to get the oil change, and then of course they're looking at an engine repair. Of course. For 10 years, the city of Long Beach and many other cities through California, we save money by deferring maintenance, and now we're looking at a very big bill. So now what we're doing is saying, we stop that, we're doing uh, maintenance again, and keeping our streets in good condition so that you don't look at a street that's going to cost 10 times more in a couple of years to repair. The flip side, though, is uh, I recently spoke with your city prosecutor, Doug Halpert, and he had lamented the fact that a few years back, Long Beach had over 1,000 police officers. Now Long Beach has under 800 police officers. Yeah. So while we definitely want to keep our cities beautiful and clean mm -hmm. and avoid that increased cost of deferred maintenance, could we be using the monies for public safety? as an example? Well, it's a great question. And that's the difference between structural revenues and one-time revenues. And explain that for our viewers, because yeah, I think so it's very important. Structural the revenues difference. come in every year. So your property taxes, sales taxes, you know they're going to be there. So you can use those money for things like salaries. One-time monies are things like uh, maybe oil price spikes. So you have some money now, but you can't count on the future because oil is very volatile. It goes up and down. So we don't want to hire a police officer with one-time monies, and then oil goes down, and we have to fire the police officer. It's not fair to that person, it's not fair to their families, and it's just bad management. So what we're saying is, let's use our ongoing monies to do things like hiring police officers, hiring firefighters, maintaining our parks and libraries. But if we have a windfall, if we get some extra money from winning a lawsuit or from the oil prices going up, let's make those additional investments in our streets that are gonna pay off over the long term. So streets no doubt are important. What about issues like libraries, um, after school programs? Mr. Halbert was mentioning that many after school programs were cut and we have seen a spike in uh, property crimes often committed by juveniles who have nothing to do because the after school programs were cut. Well, that's Although right. is that a school district issue? Well, there's a couple things. I mean, one thing, you know, you have to look at the big picture. Why are we making these cuts? Uh, we are down 20% of our police officers. We are down these programs. A big problem is our increasing uh, costs. Uh, we know the pension costs have exploded. That's why the city of Long Beach has been one of the All cities right. to be in the forefront of pension reform. So it's going to take some time, but that's why I've always said, you, if you care about programs, you better care about the money that pays for them. And that's why we've been so aggressive in trying to contain those costs. So how do you decide how, which money should be spent on which programs? Because it seems as if right now the infrastructure improvements are very focused on streets, which is important. But couldn't you use those one-time monies to build another library, as an example? So that's a great question, Brad. Well, the problem is if you build a library, we don't have the money to staff the library. True. So a lot of cities build beautiful libraries and then it stays closed. That doesn't make any sense. The other thing that's important about streets is not only do you improve your streets, does it help you have a beautiful city and help quality of life, but you're actually going to save money in the long run. And that's because well-maintained streets don't deteriorate and you don't have to spend 10 to 20 times more to repair them. So it means over the long run, because you're saving money, you have more money for things like police, fire, and libraries. And let me ask you about these one-time spending programs. Infrastructure takes bodies. I mean, you need people to work on these streets. I would hope that as a result, we see an increase in hiring. Are we seeing an increase in hiring? Either uh, employees already working for Long Beach or contractors brought in for special projects? Well, a lot of it is done by contractors. So we have city employees that kind of maintain the programs, oversee the programs. But then we have contractors, private companies that do a lot of this work. That's so, huge. Right. So as we do more of this work, we have more local companies getting business, which means more employment, which means more taxes. And that's kind of the virtuous circle of right. infrastructure work. We recently heard President Obama speak about his desire for increased infrastructure spending. I mean, obviously from Washington to Long Beach is a long way, both metaphorically and literally. Mm -hmm. But 
if we do see more infrastructure spending coming out of Washington, be it stimulus part two or something smaller or larger than that, how does Long Beach, as an example of any pretty large city in California, make sure that they get their fair share? Well, we need to be at the table advocating aggressively. But you know, another important point, Brad, whether it's in Washington or in Sacramento, we need to make sure these monies go for operating and maintaining these things, not just for building them. So I many see. cities, so many counties, they might build a new freeway, but they're not even maintaining the freeways they have. So one thing I'd say is we need to have priorities, and I'd say let's invest in maintaining what we have now first so, before we build new things that we can't maintain. With the first stimulus package from 2009, Long Beach got some money, correct? Absolutely. We we're very successful there. And so what was that used for, and are we maintaining what we've built? Yeah. So it's a great question. I think you know most of that money was used for arterial streets. So Long Beach Boulevard, Wardlow Road. Mm -hmm. If you look at those streets, they're actually in very good condition, and we can maintain those a relatively low cost. The problem now though is we didn't receive any money from the state or federal government for residential streets. Mm. So the streets that you look at when you wake up in your you know, out of your house and open the door, those streets are in very poor condition, particularly when you compare to other cities that have had the resources, whether it's Lakewood or Signal Hill. So we need to ask our question, what do we need to maintain and repair those streets that we haven't gotten federal funds for? Um, what can we do to make sure they're looking good, not just for us, but for our children. You mentioned pensions, and obviously Long Beach is very pleased about the recent pension deal uh, negotiated. I think now all your bargaining units have agreed to pension reform, is that right? All three major bargaining Ma units. Okay. For, unfortunately, arguably, um, there's some labor strife at the port. Uh, I thought that we were getting close to resolving this labor strife, but recently the port um, bargaining unit was not able to come to a resolution. How does that impact Long Beach and the greater Southern California area? Well, the port complex is our biggest industry. Clearly. So, you know, we've got a ton of jobs, and uh, those people then go out and spend money on clothes and cars and so forth. So none of us want to see a strike in the port. You know, a strike really is a lose-lose because workers aren't getting wages. Right and then it shuts down it, so it's not good for management. So, you know, obviously it's a touchy time right now, but I think we all want people to go back to the table and hammer out a deal. That's not as good for them, but for the greater region. But it seems like in a lot of ways, Long Beach is somewhat held hostage on the issue of the port, because look, I mean, you're not a port commissioner, and the port commissioners, well, they're appointed by the city of Long Beach, are That's right, we appoint the commissioners, okay. and we also oversee the budget, so we do have a lot of influence over the port of Long Beach. Over the labor negotiations as well? Well, the labor negotiations are private negotiations. They're between, you know, basically private sector workers and private sector employers. So it's hard for Who's us to do much there. Who's the private sector employer, though, in this instance? Well, it's the terminals. So basically the, the terminals and... Uh, and know, it's not, so it's not the port per se. Yeah, the port's a landlord. So the port really just leases its property to private sector companies. Those companies actually hire people and uh, have trucks come in and out. So they're the ones doing the negotiations. But despite the labor strife, there is more good news coming out of the port. The Middle Harbor project seems like it's going full steam ahead. Talk to us about how important that project is to continuing the revitalization of this area's economy. Well, like I mentioned before, you know, we need to invest if we want to grow. Right. And we're building a billion dollar bridge, an over billion dollar Middle Harbor project. And these projects are important, not just because they're going to generate jobs and tax receipts, although that's critical, but also because they're going to also clean the air. You know, one thing we've seen is we've been able to have all this growth while having a, a reduction of 80% in diesel a miracle. pollution from trucks. It really is a miracle yeah. how the, the plug-in project that we've heard about. And again, President Obama has talked about his desire to attack climate change. Could that benefit Long Beach through spending dollars on uh, more clean air programs out of the port? Well, yeah. One thing I've met with, actually, Senator Feinstein's office with, sure. and also our new Congress member, Alan Lowenthal, I said, what can we do to get federal support for projects like zero emissions goods moving? Right. If we can move goods from the ports to nearby facilities, like train facilities, without polluting neighborhoods, right. that's really the holy grail. Because you're going to be able to unlock and get that growth that we need so desperately while improving quality of life for our neighborhoods. I think it can be done. The federal government should be a partner. In. Okay, his name is James Johnson. He is a member of the Long Beach City Council. My name is Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching Charter, California Edition.